The Palestinian movement is hostile to individual liberty, including and especially the liberty of Palestinians themselves. Israel can no more defeat the narrowly defined Palestinian movement than the mass of American military machine could win any sort of military victory in Iraq or Afghanistan. The Palestinian Authority, moreover, incites its own people to commit atrocities, attacks against Israelis, knife attacks, car rammings, and other kinds of violent actions. This is a one-sided tale that my opponent is telling of good Israelis and bad Palestinians. It's a necessary condition to reach peace that the Palestinian movement be defeated. Oftentimes, one must work with talk to, and compromise with certain nefarious actors. Now uh, for the main event. Um, tonight's resolution reads, to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, Israel must first achieve defeat of the Palestinian movement. Arguing for the affirmative, Elon Giorno. Elon, please come to the stage. Arguing for the negative, Danny Surzin. Danny, please come to the stage. Jane, please close the voting. Good evening. Thank you, Jean, for inviting me. Thank you, Danny, for joining the debate. And thank you to the sponsors of tonight's event. Tonight's resolution presupposes a detailed analysis of a hugely complicated conflict. That's the analysis I offer in my book, What Justice Demands. And here, let me indicate one crucial point to start with. So much of the debate and the discussion about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is bound up in religious, ethnic, nationalist, and tribal premises. And these get us nowhere. Instead, I suggest we need to adopt a different approach. We need to adopt a secular, individualist, pro-freedom perspective. That's the framework that I offer in my book, and that's what I'll be arguing from tonight. And the reason for this is that I believe, and I think you can demonstrate objectively, that individual liberty is an objective moral ideal. It is true for all people, in all places, at all times. And I believe that freedom is the standard by which we should evaluate the adversaries in this conflict. So this individual's perspective that I'm arguing for leads us to discard collectivist and tribal premises and that whole way of thinking. And one of the major uh, steps in this uh, way of thinking is we need to recognize a major distinction that I think gets blurred and completely uh, ignored by many people. There's a... a, a crucial difference between the Palestinian community and the Palestinian movement. We, we have to be, keep these separate and distinct. The community is a, a group of individuals who recognize themselves as part of the Palestinian identity and they have features of a culture. And the Palestinian movement is an ideological political enterprise. It has specific goals and an ideology. And it claims to speak for the Palestinian community. There is overlap between the two, that's definitely true, but they can't be treated as interchangeable. They're not. They're distinct, and we have to keep them distinguished when we think about this issue. This debate hinges on a moral evaluation of the adversaries. So let's ask, does the Palestinian movement seek freedom? Is it pro-human progress? Is it concerned with righting wrongs done to the Palestinian community? No, no, and no. I argue that the Palestinian movement is hostile to individual liberty, including and especially the liberty of Palestinians themselves. And by contrast, I argue, Israel is a region's only free society. It has flaws and moral failings, really serious ones. And these need to be addressed and reformed. But none of these warrant the Palestinian movement's aggression against it. If you want to understand this conflict, I think it's crucial to see that the Palestinian movement is an obstacle to peace. It's a fundamental barrier to progress in this region. Let me stress, this debate does not hinge on the question of whether individual Palestinians have grievances. They do. 
some of them are legitimate grievances and they need to be redressed. And I argue this in my book. For example, there are cases of Israeli land expropriation or cases where the Israeli police fail to protect the landowners who are Palestinians from Jewish religious fundamentalists who attack them. That is wrong. It's a violation of the rule of law and it has to be stopped. But even when you take all of these flaws and failings into account, they do not, and it's particularly the grievances which I regard as legitimate, they do not justify the militant goal of the Palestinian movement, which is to liquidate Israel. That's been true since the founding of the major factions of this movement. The Palestinian movement, in a word, has exploited the people it claims to be serving and protecting and righting wrongs for. In reality, the Palestinian movement is hostile to freedom and does not care about righting wrongs done to the people it claims to serve. If you look at who, what is the Palestinian movement, what is it composed of, there are two major wings. The Palestinian Liberation Organization, or the PLO, and Hamas, the Islamist wing. Both were founded with a shared goal of bringing an end to Israel as a society. Both are hostile to rights and individual freedom. And they, tra they actively now, in the present day, not in some future state that they are claiming to seek, right now they're trampling the rights of their own people. The PLO runs the Palestinian Authority, which is an interim quasi-state. It was supposed to be a step toward full sovereignty. And this is mostly in the parts of the West Bank. It is a dictatorial authoritarian regime. The president of this organization, this entity is Mahmoud Abbas. Uh, he, his four-year term as president ended about 10 years ago, and he is still in power, and he's not leaving. He's going to appoint the next prime minister, it seems. If you try to live there, you'll realize quickly there is no freedom of speech. There's no freedom of association. If you criticize Abbas, who is the dictator in, in place, you may well be thrown in jail. And God help you if you're a Christian or if you're gay under the Palestinian Authority. You would be hounded out if you make it out alive. And the Palestinian Authority, moreover, incites its own people to commit atrocities, attacks against Israelis, knife attacks, car rammings, and other kinds of violent actions. And they celebrate the perpetrators of these attacks as martyrs to the cause. And the Palestinian Authority, led by the PLO, should be, we should note, this is what is considered by many people as the moderate wing of the Palestinian movement. So let's look at what people regard as beyond the pale, Hamas. This is the Islamist faction which runs Gaza. And it took over in a bloody coup in 2007. It has injected Islamist ideas into the, the, the area where it rules, and it's conducted summary executions in the street. Hamas has fought rocket wars against Israel numerous times in 2008, 2012, 2014, and there have been small skirmishes uh, in between there. And of course, there were rocket, uh, two rockets fired from Gaza last week toward Tel Aviv. And Hamas is notorious for inciting its people to commit suicide bombings and to celebrate their acts of destruction of other people. This not only through the mainstream uh, press that Hamas controls, but through children's programming and magazines. It is inculcating really perverse ideas. So when you look at the Palestinian movement, you realize that this is a movement that is hostile to freedom, that does not care about the lives of the people it governs. And this is a movement committed to liquidating a free society, a basically free society, and the region's only free society in the Middle East. That's what I'll, I'll suggest and what I argue in depth in my book. Now, let me stress, I've argued that the Palestinian movement is hostile to freedom. Let me argue, let me indicate some reasons to think that it is not concerned with righting wrongs, actual wrongs done to Palestinians. In fact, you can see by the way it's governing, that to the extent that it has control, to the extent that it has self-government in Gaza and parts of the West Bank, the Palestinian movement has inflicted its own forms of injustice, which I've mentioned. There is no freedom of speech under its control. Minorities are persecuted horribly, religious and uh, other minorities. But worse than this, to the extent they have control over these people, of the Palestinian community, 
the Palestinian movement is not really opposed to the kinds of crimes that it accuses Israel of, such as arbitrary arrest, censorship, expropriation, because it itself is committing these, uh, these crimes against its own people. In my book, I mention one uh, notable example, which is uh, a Qatari businessman who came to the Palestinian territories to open a bank and help build out the, uh, um, what was beginning to be a new state, the Palestinian Authority. His bank and his personal property were expropriated from him by the Palestinian Authority in broad daylight. And there are many other examples of this. Now, one other thing to note about the Palestinian Authority, which again is the, is the wing within the Palestinian movement that many people regard as dealable with. And the one, uh, Mahmoud Abbas is, a sort of, is one of the people that is invited and who visits the White House. He has that kind of diplomatic status. Under the Palestinian Authority, it is a crime to sell land to Jews. So this is, a, is defined by people's race, right? Their ethnicity. And it's the, the kind of punishment you can get, and people actually face this punishment, is hard labor for life. And the maximum penalty is death. Just keep that in mind. So let me turn now to look at Israel briefly. And what I want to argue here is that if you take seriously the value of human life, the value of human progress and of freedom, it's crucial to recognize a stark moral difference and a moral inequality between Israel and the Palestinian movement. Israel stands out as a, as a basically free society, one with many flaws and um, moral failings. And yet it has freedom of speech. It has religious freedom, intellectual freedom. All citizens, regardless of race or creed, have the right to vote and be part of the government. Now, there are going to be objections to Israel's moral standing. And uh, I was, I'll anticipate some of them here, which is that it's an ethnic national state and that it's an apartheid state. I oppose the ethnic national elements of Israel. I regard Israel as a combination of individualist elements that are good, and that's what leads it to protect individual rights, and national ethnic elements and religious elements, which I regard as a problem and a source of its failings. Uh, we can talk about the apartheid uh, claim, which deserves more attention in the question period. And I invite you to ask me about that. I want to make the case for why I think the, the main barrier here to, to reaching, uh, moving forward towards peace is the Palestinian movement. To the extent that the current approach has been tried, the two-state solution, it's led to empowering the Palestinian movement. It's given them a mini-state, in effect, in the West Bank and Gaza, which is a militant regime that is hostile to the lives of the people it controls. And retrying the, the peace process that leads to a two-state solution, which is the, the entrenched approach, is going to lead to the same kind of outcome. It's not going to change until the, the ideas that are animating the Palestinian movement are changed or it gives up its goal, which is what I advocate. So the, the approach that's been tried so far has only made the conflict worse. More people have died in violence since the signing of the famous uh, peace process deal under Bill Clinton in, 20, in 1993 than did in the 25 years before that. So this is a bad attempt to, sol to solve the problem because I think it evades the character of the adversaries and particularly the Palestinian movement. What I'm advocating for instead, what I'm uh, suggesting is that it's a necessary condition to reach peace that the Palestinian movement be defeated. And I, this is because I, I think what's happening is that it's a protracted war between two sides. And wars typically end, if you look at history, when one side gives up its goals, when it puts down its arms as uh, hopeless and its goal is unachievable. And that's what I'm suggesting needs to happen with the Palestinian movement. It needs to lose heart. It needs to give up its so-called armed struggle and its jihad. And through a combination of economic, political, and military pressure, the infrastructure of the Palestinian movement in the West Bank and the Palestinian in the Gaza Strip needs to be uprooted. This is a long-term process. It's not going to happen overnight. And the crucial thing that has to happen is a psychological or a mind shift. People need to, the followers of the Palestinian movement, the leaders of the Palestinian movement, need to abandon their goal of liquidating Israel and creating a society that is an authoritarian one, which is what they've been acting on all this time. And a major thing that can be done from outside the conflict is that 
all of us in this room, all of us who have influence, and particularly the governments that uh, here in the, in the US and in Canada and in Europe, need to with, withdraw their moral endorsement of the idea that the Palestinian state is a goal to be achieved. Because what we've seen when it's ma materialized, even to a small degree, is that it is hostile to freedom, and it's a militant regime that, is ho that seeks to under uh, undermine Israel. Withdrawing that moral sanction and, and the financial support that makes it possible, I think, is critical to reaching the point at which the Palestinian movement feels defeated and gives up its goal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elan. Uh, Danny Sersen for the negative. Thank you. My opponent has undoubtedly laid out a passionate, detailed defense of Israeli policy over the last half century. He's also highlighted the very worst aspects of what he dubs the Palestinian movement. Were his remarks merely an unopposed introduction to this rather complex topic, the very simplicity of the model would likely be persuasive. Unfortunately, as a veteran of two wars in the greater Middle East and a budding scholar of Israel-Palestine, I found matters in this region far more nuanced and thorny than all that. It is for this reason that I must oppose this resolution tonight, along with the black and white thinking that informs its very framework. I cannot promise you any neat models, nor any simple, reassuring solutions to this intractable conflict. Rather, I hope to present a middling approach to conflict resolution that accepts as genuine the fears for Israeli security, but does not dismiss the plight of the Palestinians outright. Mine is a path of empathy and an attempt at even-handedness. For one-sided solutions, such as my opponent has crafted here tonight, will never bring peace to the Holy Land. That said, the Israeli-Palestinian crisis, as many of us know, is a veritable third rail in American political discourse. So it may be necessary for me to start with a few disclaimers. I speak as someone who is not anti-Semitic, who opposes anti-Semitism in all the ugly forms it takes, and who believes the Israeli state has a right to exist. Now that that's out of the way, I have to address the controversial caveat. Palestinians, for both moral and strategic reasons, also deserve state sovereignty and equivalent civil rights. And that should be the stated position of libertarians all real small c conservatives and my debate opponent tonight. Israel is neither saint nor Satan, neither is Palestine. These are two fluid societies that shift with domestic and international winds. The two sides do not operate in a Manichaean world of good evil duality, no matter how much some of us would like them to. In that vein, I shall oppose tonight's resolution on the basis of three major arguments. First, I reject as deceptive the very term Palestinian movement, especially as Mr. Giorno has pejoratively defined it. This movement is no single thing, and it's certainly not nearly as simple or as evil Islamist jihadi as the labels that my opponent prefers. Second, I shall demonstrate that the vast majority of Palestinian organizations, even Hamas, can and should be dealt with as potential partners in negotiations. Indeed, despite all the blood spilt in recent years, both Fatah and Hamas are more willing than ever before to make peace along the pre-1967 borders, accept a two-state solution, and at least tacitly recognize Israel's right to exist. Further, I'll indicate that it's often been Israel, especially under its contemporary right-wing government, that has provoked Hamas, broken truces, and otherwise sought to undermine the very existence of a popular, democratically elected Palestinian movement. And finally, I'll argue that peace necessitates not a fantastical notion of, quote, defeat of the Palestinian movement, which is neither plausible nor grounded in fairness. Rather, what peace does require is the isolation and, com and condemnation of most terroristic elements of Palestinian resistance, but it demands that we recognize and condemn Israeli policies that also hinder conflict resolution. Indeed, in some cases, making peace impossible. And, and that's what's missing from my opponent's opening remarks the notion that Israel has a role to play in reforming. You see, in, in the way it's been laid out, the Palestinians are evil. Their movement, at least their leaders, are all evil. They can't be dealt with, and I reject that. So finally, I'll argue that peace necessitates um, that 
any solution in the Holy Land will not be forthcoming unless the Israeli government, or hopefully a successor administration, reverses course in its militarization and escalation of the occupation regime and opens its mind and heart to authentic negotiation with all components of the multifaceted Palestinian movement. So let us begin with my first assertion, the resolution's problematic definition of the Palestinian movement. I mean, take a moment to read, to actually read the resolution tonight, that staggering sentence that my opponent has affirmed. I'm going to break down three main parts of it. First off, it's clear from the resolution and from my opponent's remarks that he places Israel and Israelis at the center of this model. To him, Israel represents everything good in the world, juxtaposed with all the evil Arab states of the region. Israel and Israelis can do no wrong. This is problematic not only because there are good people and good faith movements in the Middle East, I've met many of them, but because he lets Israel off the hook for its own flawed policies, human rights abuses, and sometimes undemocratic tendencies in the territories. Educated Israelis should seek to improve their own society just as Americans should. It doesn't make you un-American or unpatriotic to critique American foreign policy. I will say the same uh, applies to Israel. But you'll hear very little of that tonight. This is a one-sided tale that my opponent is telling of good Israelis and bad Palestinians or good Israeli movements and bad Palestinian movements. Indeed, you'll, quite, you'll hear quite little of the somehow absent Palestinians from my opponent tonight. The Palestinians are almost the elephant in the room that no one dares speak of. Then there's the term defeat. I must say that as a combat soldier and officer, having conducted fruitless counterinsurgency in Iraq and Afghanistan, which is remarkably similar to duty in the West Bank and Gaza, in fact, we study it, the very term, quote, defeat, has come to seem rather absurd. Highly unrealistic. How can one people, how can one a defeat a people's movement? Can one even win a true counterinsurgency? I'm quite doubtful, and so are most military historians. But that's precisely the assumption of this resolution, that Israel can and should defeat the Palestinians. This, ladies and gentlemen, is fantasy. It's, it's wishful thinking at best. Lastly, we return to the problematic phrase, Palestinian movement. My opponent believes that today's Palestinian movement is the enemy, an entity worthy only of destruction. I think that when he looks at Palestine and Palestinians and their organizations, what he sees is ISIS. That Palestinian equals Islamo-fascist jihadism, but Palestinians, okay, are little more than terrorists in this telling, and that's just not accurate. Beyond being wildly inaccurate, it's a very, very dangerous conception. It leads to a lack of empathy for a lack of concern with civilian lives. A demonstrable fact is this, the vast majority of Palestinians, like the vast majority of Muslims, are not civilian slaughtering terrorists. Palestinians are a manifold, diverse people. In fact, they're the most highly educated Arab people on the planet. Yes, there are monsters among them, but this is a small fraction of a vigorous and beautiful whole. So the crux of this first argument is that the very framework, the very language and construction of the resolution is poorly defined, factually inaccurate, unachievable, and one-sided. So much so that on this point alone, one should vote down the resolution. Nevertheless, let us turn to my second major argument, that the vast majority of Palestinian organizations, even Hamas, can and should be dealt with as potential partners in negotiation. Service in America's never-ending post-9-11 wars has taught me that sometimes, oftentimes, one must work with, talk to, and compromise with certain nefarious actors. The U.S. military tried, quote, defeating Sunni Islamo-nationalism in Western Iraq for four full years with little or no success, to the tune of 2,000 dead soldiers. Only when forward-thinking colonels and a willing general, David Petraeus, began talking to the Sunni tribesmen and dividing them from the most extreme elements of the insurgency, did the U.S. Army achieve a drop in violence. This, mind you, was a very hard pill for us to swallow. In fact, many of our new partners in the Sunni tribes had literal American blood on their hands. Still, there was no alternative course with any hope to lower violence, ultimately protect U.S. soldiers and bring a semblance of peace than to work with the Muslims of the region, work with the Sunni Islamists. In much the same way, Israel must deal with any Palestinian individual or organization that is ready to accept a long-term truce and a two-state solution. Why? Because there is no other path to peace. None. Isolating Fatah or even Hamas will alienate perhaps three quarters of the Palestinian people. The notion that upon the defeat of Hamas's leadership or Fatah's leadership, the Palestinians are just going to lay down 
okay, and give up and form some sort of new version of themselves, one that looks like an Israeli just zipped up inside of them, is fantasy. To keep on this path will freeze any movement towards peace, increase violence, and birth, and I promise you, birth a generation far more radical than the past Palestinian generation. Even Hamas, the unidimensional villain of Mr. Giorno's movement, is a far more complex and evolving movement than he gives them credit for. Though it formed as an Islamist response to 20 years of Israeli occupation in 1987, though at times after 1994 it engaged in suicide attacks on Israeli civilians, and though its early charter denied the right of Israel to exist, even Hamas has changed and has come a long way. In reality, the Hamas of 2019 is not the Hamas of 1987, and the organization can be dealt with rather than, quote, defeated. Indeed, it has often been Israel that broke truces and provoked Hamas, such as in the 2004 Israeli assassination of Hamas founder Sheikh Ahmed Yassin, a quadriplegic in a wheelchair. This targeted killing came on the heels of Yassin having stated, listen to this, Hamas could accept a Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. Furthermore, that leader had also offered a long-term truce in exchange for an Israeli withdrawal from the occupied territories. This was a significant shift in Hamas policy that should have been capitalized on. Instead, Israel turned to violence, refusing then as it refuses now to deal with and compromise with Hamas. What's more, in 2006, Hamas published a manifesto that lacked any reference to the old goal of eliminating Israel, another positive change in the direction of negotiation. Instead, both the US and Israel punished Hamas and by extension the majority of Palestinian people who voted for them in the Gaza Strip, both imposed sanctions and withheld much needed funding. The New York Times, certainly not known for any anti-Israeli bias, concluded that this was all part of the plan, quote, to destabilize the Palestinian government so that newly elected Hamas officials will fail and elections will be called again. This sounds a lot like a coup, except the coup rather than being Hamas taking over, appears to be Israel and the United States overturning a democratically uh, sanctioned election. The bottom line is that by associating the Palestinian movement with the dictatorial nature of secular Arab states and the violence of Islamic extremism, my opponent denies the legitimacy of the Palestinian struggle. I reject the simplicity and the factuality of that assumption. I'll now turn to my third and final argument, that Israel has its own flawed policies I'm going to flip the resolution here and assert that aspects, not everything about Israel, but aspects of the Israeli movement must be reversed before true peace is possible. Among others, these are, one, a perennial military occupation of the West Bank and Gaza. Two, an illegal settlements regime, which is a colonization of the West Bank. Three, a brutal blockade of the Gaza Strip. And four, an unacceptably disproportionate lack of concern for Palestinian civilian casualties. Now, there's no time for history lesson. I have maybe three, four minutes left, but let me briefly address these grievances. First, it is an indisputable fact that the founding of Israel in 1948 and the expansion of Israel after the 1967 war created millions of displaced Palestinian refugees. Now, my saying this does not mean that Israel must give it all back. That's unrealistic. Or cease to exist. That would be a genocide but rather it recognizes the genuine suffering and grievance of the Palestinian people, that there are two sides in this argument. Mine is the side that says there are guilty parties on both sides, but there are those we can work with on both sides. But you don't have to take my word for it. Consider a 1969 interview with the Israeli defense minister and national hero Moshe Dayan, where he admitted, we came to this country which was already populated by Arabs, and we are establishing a Hebrew that is a Jewish state here. Jewish villages were built in place of Arab villages. You do not even know the name of these villages, and I do not blame you because the geography looks no longer exist. Not only do the books not exist, but the Arab villages are not there either. This is the one place, there is not one place built in this country that did not have a former Arab population. Then there's the settlements regime. The bottom line is this, until Israel dismantles its settlements and returns that land to the rightful Palestinian ownership, then it is in violation of international law and impeding the peace. The idea that the Palestinians are going to lay down and accept any sort of solution while massive, massive numbers of Israeli citizens, upwards of 500,000, are living in these settlements is, it's fantasy. I can tell you these people are not going to quit. That's not how insurgencies end historically. The brutal blockade of Gaza is, uh, is enormously cruel. In fact, 
To demonstrate the cruelty and premeditation of this blockade, let us consider that a prominent Israeli governing official actually took to literally calculating the number of calories a person in Gaza needed, lest there be an outright famine. Someone, one of the aides to Prime Minister Ariel Sharon, reportedly joked that because they voted the wrong way for Hamas, Palestinians would undergo something like an appointment with the doctor. They will get a lot thinner, but they won't die. Let me conclude my opening remarks in a rather sullen way. I would be remiss if I did not recognize the historic crimes perpetrated against Jews and of the worst crime in world history, the Holocaust. For those reasons, among those reasons, I believe Israel has the right to exist and to be secure. But here's what I also believe. There is a second side to this conflict. There are Palestinians with genuine grievances, with leaders who can be negotiated with and should be negotiated with. They can not be defeated, nor should they be, if there's any sense of equity and fairness. Thank you. Elan for the rebuttal. Take it away, Elan. The Palestinian movement, I said, <clears throat> just needs to be distinguished from the Palestinian people. And I, I, I guess that didn't really sink in, so let me amplify that point. Uh, there is no question that there are Palestinians who have suffered wrongs, and I think they need to have those wrongs redressed. But let me focus on the claim that the Palestinian leadership and the movement because that seems to be the crux of your argument. The Palestinian movement is not monolithic. I did not say that it was uniform. I said there are two major wings. And it's correct to equate it with the Islamist movement, but it's not the same as ISIS. The Islamist movement is rather large. It includes both Saudi Arabia and Iran, which are conflicted uh, countries, and ISIS, which both of them uh, dislike. The Palestinian movement originated primarily as an ethnic nationalist movement, and then it morphed over many years into a, what is now primarily a religious Islamist movement. And you can see that this is documented in the rise of religiosity within the territories, and it's reflected in the rising fortunes of Hamas. Now, it is important to recognize what Hamas's goals are and what they remain. So it is certainly true that Hamas has issued memor uh, documents and manifestos, and the most recent one was not 20, 2006, it was actually 2017, I believe, where it issued a policy statement. And this was read as Hamas is moderating. Now, I will, com I will concede Hamas has changed, its has changed in tactical ways. For example, it joined the elections in 2006, in which it won by a landslide. These are tactical maneuvers that it has done, and the most recent one in 2017 was to insulate itself from the, um, the stench of the Muslim Brotherhood, which was in very ill repute in Egypt, Egypt being on the border of Gaza, and from Qatar, which does not like the Muslim Brotherhood and, wants, and that Hamas wants to be funded by. Hamas, I think, retains its goal. It has not disavowed its goal of liquidating Israel. None of those documents do that when you read them closely. What it does is it presents itself in terms that are meant to, how shall I put it, to gull and fool people into thinking that Hamas is somehow dealable with. Uh, I don't think that's true, and I think the principle that you can deal with anyone, this is a very common principle in diplomacy, it's false. You cannot, it's not true that you can make a deal with anyone and that there are factions within Hamas that are better uh, to the point where you can deal with them. That's just not valid. Um, and you can see the evidence for that when the P, because we had the same argument about the Palestinian Liberation Organization changing its position and accepting Israel, and it went through a number of hoops to do that and to prove itself in 1988. Uh, that actually went exactly as you, how one would expect. It was a lie. And the same thing happened in 1993 when Arafat stood on, on the stage with Bill Clinton and Rabin, and that again was a lie. It didn't, the Palestinian movement did not then and has not since repudiated its goal, even if in tactical ways it has moderated its positions to seem more appealing and, uh, uh, um, and to lure people back to the negotiating table. What happened when this was taken on faith is that the Palestinian 
movement was given uh, a quasi-state in the Palestinian Authority, which enabled it with money and arms to carry out what was then called the Second Intifada, or rather a war against Israel by suicide bombers and other kinds of attacks that was one of the most lethal outbreaks of violence there has been in this conflict. Let me mention, you raised some of the historical points, which I invite people in the audience to raise in the question period when we can have more discussion of it. Um, I think it's important to recognize that, in fact, the grievances are treated as, well, they're obviously wrong, right? Or there's real wrongs here. I think it's, I, I'm in favor of nuance, and that's why it took me a book to argue uh, my point. Um, I think you're missing some of those, including with the settlement, which I think cannot be treated as a, as a uniform phenomenon. And I'm certainly not in favor of uh, Israeli policy. I'm not here to defend it. I'm arguing for Israel's position as a free society to the extent it's free and for as long as it's free and for as long as it's uh, carrying out policies that are consonant with that. I do not support, I certainly don't support all the policies that it is enacting and I oppose many of them as you'll find in my book. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I have about five minutes to address some of the rebuttals from uh, the last two statements from my opponent, who is very well informed and, and has written an excellent book on the topic. I have one question. Why is it, and this is really hypothetical, Israel's state to give to the Palestinians? The whole framing seems problematic. It seems that if Israel has a right to exist, there's a right, an equivalent right for Palestine to exist. Yet in this telling, it is Israel that somehow has the ability, the right even, to grant what's been called a quasi-state to the Palestinians, which is little more than an open-air prison in many ways, which is little more than a collaborationist regime in many ways. My opponent spoke in his early remarks about a, fr a pro-freedom perspective, and I, I agree that that should be the framework, but what about the life and situation of actual living, breathing Palestinians in Gaza today who lack civil rights, who lack the basic freedoms of even Arabs within Israel who already don't have the same rights as Jews within Israel, but who live under military occupation 50 years after the 1967 war in defiance of every single ruling of any international court or international organization. Now, perhaps 180 countries in the world are all just anti-Semitic, and only Israel and the United States are correct, or maybe there's something to these grievances for not just the Palestinian people, but for their movement which represents them. I agree with my opponent that this should hinge on the moral interpretation, but a moral interpretation would again make one wonder why there are no civil and political rights and no Palestinian state sovereignty. My opponent also says that the Palestinian movement is an obstacle to peace, but what about Israeli obstacles? Except for just a vague notion of Israel's not perfect, for my opponent, there's no list of what the Israeli obstacles to peace are. Why is there nothing about this? I'd argue the silence on this issue is more telling than anything my opponent says. I think it's a fallacy that the Palestinian movement is dedicated to the destruction of Israel. Uh, in 1993, actually before then, the PLO did accept the right of Israel to exist, did accept a two-state solution. Even Hamas, while it didn't change its full original document, has made it clear that it's willing to accept a two-state solution from its highest leadership levels and that it will accept the long-term truce. The truth of the matter is Israel never made steps towards the final settlement that 1993's Oslo was supposed to create. If the Palestinian movement is so harmful to Palestinians, why did they vote it in? Why did so many of them turn to Hamas? Could it be that part of it was frustration with the lack of progress towards a Palestinian state? Could it be the intransigence of Israel in many cases? Not every time. Not every Palestinian leader is a saint. Not every Israeli leader is a villain. But the reality is there are two sides to this story. There are two sides to this situation. The question for me is what if Palestinians vote the wrong way? It appears you either have to believe in democracy or not. Democracy appears okay for Israelis because we can, we're happy with the way they vote. But what about when the Palestinians democratically elect Hamas into government? Who then has the right to determine that Hamas cannot be dealt with? Like I said, in Iraq and Afghanistan, we dealt with people who literally had the blood of our soldiers on our hands. 
and it worked. And we didn't like it one bit. I still don't. But what I knew is that we're never gonna defeat the Iraqi nationalist movement in Iraq. We're never gonna defeat militarily the Taliban in Afghanistan. Good luck, the Soviets tried. We've been trying. Folks, spoiler alert, it's not, it's not gonna happen. They're not going to just give up and roll over. This is not gonna happen. It is ahistorical from a military history standpoint. Putting down their arms is not how movements end. Compromise and politicization of movements is how they end. So these steps of Hamas towards negotiation are the signs of possibility for peace. Take the Irish Republican Army. After 30 years of being told that the IRA will never, ever settle for peace, they didn't just lay down their arms, they were brought into the movement. So much so that today members of parliament in Britain used to be IRA brigade commanders in Northern Ireland. But the British swallowed their pride and realized they had to deal with people who had blood on their hands. Otherwise, they would fight this war for another 1,100 years, and that's the reality. Do the Palestinians have some sort of biological predilection for evil? I think not. Perhaps there is a historic injustice and some role the Israelis are playing in this. I think that the silence on the issue of Israeli perpetuation of violence and human rights abuses is instructive. Thank you. Uh, thanks to you both. Uh, and, uh, we go to the Q&A, a part of the question, a part of the evening. Uh, I'm uh, take moderator's prerogative to uh, ask a couple of questions. Uh, uh, first, uh, to uh, Danny Surzin, and of course you can come in as well, Elon. Uh, you, have, uh, you have affirmed your own support of Israel's right to exist, and Elon was saying that most recently uh, Hamas seems to be ambiguous about that. Uh, you say that in their uh, that in Hamas's form, basic document, they still, do they deny Israel's right to exist? Well, my particular question, most sharply, is what is your best evidence that Hamas has affirmatively stated, as you have stated, that Israel has a right to exist? That's a, that's a great question. Is it? Yeah. Mm. I'll just talk. Oh, no, no, we, we want to, we, this is recorded for our posterity. <laughs> okay, that's a great question. Well, for positive evidence, I like evidence, I'm a statistics guy. There have been three wars in Gaza since 2008. Operation Cast Lead was 2008, there was another war in 2012, and another in 2014. Uh, the US State Department actually recognized, as well as a, an international uh, terrorist analysis organization in Israel, that got the, the Hamas fighters actually showed um, a, a fair amount of acceptance of the long-term truce, and it was actually Israel that broke the truce in each of those cases. So in all three cases, uh, Israel actually conducted raids into Gaza, broke the truce, at which point rockets were then fired very inaccurately into Israel. And then of course the response was overwhelming Palestinian casualties, 1,371 in Operation Cast Lead, of which 772 were civilians and some 320 were civilians, or were children. So I think what we can do is look at how Hamas acts rather than what's in their founding document. Hamas is dealing with radicals in their own ranks, they're dealing with moderates in their own ranks, and they're dealing with the folks who want to work with Israel, who want to work with the Palestinian Authority. So what I think we're seeing is Hamas is waging a battle because it's a fluid organization to maintain the truces. And what we know is Hamas is capable of maintaining a long-term truce. It is as capable of holding a long-term truce as Israel, which at this point is enough from my perspective, to negotiate with. Doesn't mean we have to fall in love with Hamas. We have to deal with their reality, that they win elections, and they're going to have to be dealt with on some level. You want to comment, Elan, to, uh, to that answer? Uh, ask the question. Okay, uh, the question to you, Elan, and then I'm gonna give, give it over to either of you or to the audience. Uh, you said a couple of times that there are legitimate Palestinian grievances that should be redressed. Um, could you elaborate on those grievances that should be specifically redressed? Sure, can I be heard? Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, I mentioned two of them, and I think they're important because they speak to the moral framework that I'm bringing. Um, one of the worst things that's happening in Israel right now is that Jewish fundamentalists are trying to uh, illegally settle land. 
And I, and, uh, I think that is wrong. It, it, it violates the law in Israel. It's a violation of the rule of law. And one of the ways they do this is they basically squat. I mean, in English law, squatting is when you just take over someone's property and you sit there until they, and you exclude them. They do this and then they expect the government to come protect them. And they have accomplices within, the within various levels of government. I think this is wrong. It, it essentially steals land that does not belong to, that belongs to Palestinians. And the Israeli, the Israeli government has removed many of these illegal outposts and settlements and, and dismantled them by force. And I think that's one example where there's real wrongs done to Palestinians right now, not in history, living, breathing people now who are suffering. Another kind of example that happens is not only um, uh, those kinds of squatting situations, but attacks on Palestinian orchards uh, that are carried out, again, often by religious fundamentalist Jews. And they, the, the point of that is you destroy someone's olive grove or their orchards, and you basically ruin their farm. And, and that's destroying their property. And they should be, the, the perpetrators of those crimes have to be stopped and uh, um, put in jail and punished in the full extent of the law. Um, I think there are, so one of the things I would say about grievances is that um, Danny mentioned uh, the refugee problem. I think re the refugee problem is probably the thorniest one. And that's one where I think it, it's really complicated to untangle because part of the problem, which Danny hasn't really brought out in his historical snapshot, is that what led to that war was the initiation of war by neighboring Arab states in 1948. And that the culpability for that has been evaded over time, and that the attempts to resettle those refugees and the attempt to reduce the number and to compensate them, they were all pushed aside. And refugees that are settled in Lebanon, for example, are in a situation that is worse than Gaza. If you want a place with a wall around it and they can't bring in cement and they can't become citizens, go to look at Lebanon. That's, that is a real crime. And I, I've heard nothing about the crimes against the Palestinians done by the Arab, Arab regimes that refuse to give them any kind of succor or uh, 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 um, citizenship, or even to get a job if you're in, in Lebanon. So I think there are real grievances. Some of them are, and I think one of the problems with the refugee uh, uh, grievance is that it's been inflated there. There are seven times more refugees now after 70 plus years than there were at the time of this war. And one reason for that is that there's a politicized way in which they're defined. You could be a, you could be a, a citizen of Jordan who's fully resettled in Jordan, uh, and yet be counted as a refugee. And you can be a refugee who's in a refugee camp. So there's something really wrong with the way that's accounted for. And so I think the politicization of that grievance makes it really hard to untangle. And the worst part is that the Palestinian movement, this is uniform, including the supposed moderates, they hold that it's an absolute wholesale right of return. So basically, six million people have to come back into Israel. Now, that is a, there's something really fishy about that. I think you have to agree. And that's not a grievance that I think you can easily remedy because you have to really think about what happened in the history and figure out the culpability of all parties, not just Israel, which is usually the one who's painted as uh, the, the villain I here. Uh, do you want to comment yeah, on that? Yeah. 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 Keep, keep so um, I think it's important that we note that largely the reason there are so many more Palestinians, seven times as many refugees, is mostly towards a natural high birth rate. Um, and uh, what's What's not mentioned is that there were plans in place by the Israeli military or the nascent Israeli military to conduct ethnic cleansing in Palestine in 1948. Uh, the most esteemed Israeli historians like Benny Morris admitted this. David Ben-Gurion has admitted to it. He's been on the record. I can read quotes. Um, th this was a historical crime. It pales in comparison to the Holocaust. And any time that people try to equate them, I think they're wrong. But it doesn't deny that there was truly a grievance there. Um, and also, yes, many of them may have become, out of necessity, citizens of Jordan, but I would imagine that people who left Poland in response to World War II, though they quickly became citizens of the United States, if they could, would still consider themselves refugees from Poland. Now, as for rights of return, I think it's very interesting. First of all, I don't think that six million people can actually come into Israel. That's going to have to be arbitrated with a symbolic right of return and compensation. It's just, it's not possible for Jewish to remain both democratic and Jewish while letting six million Palestinians in. I recognize that. But you know who does have a right of return based on religion? Israel. A right of return for any Jew worldwide. So what I'm interested in is why does that right, which is based purely on religion and ethnicity, 
why does that exist, but the right for Palestinians whose grandparents were you know, kicked out of their villages should be so easily dismissed? I, I think it's a, it's a fascinating dichotomy, and it's problematic. You want to comment, in? Yeah. Uh, so I'm glad you raised that, because the right of return is Israel's immigration law that permits, as you said, instant or almost instant uh, citizenship to Jews. I think that's a real problem. I don't think we can treat that as the principle by which to, to hold both sides accountable to, because a lot of countries have that kind of rule, but I think it's a problem. I think it reflects the, the motivations for establishing Israel. But I think just a couple of corrections on, on some of the things you've said. Um, Benny Morris does not think, as far as I read him, that there's a premeditated plan to cleanse the land. I think he's written on the contrary that that's the opposite. And in fact, the, the evidence, and I think it's worth reading other historians too, that part of what happened, there was a lot of people who left as a consequence of the war, and it was military contingencies that led to them being, uh, to fleeing. Now, the high number of refugees is not exclusively birth rate related. It is the fact that unique among all refugees in history that we know of, they're defined as, um, you can be a refugee through your father's bloodline. So if you're born to someone as a refugee, even if you are not born present in that place where the war happened, you're a refugee, and so are your children through the male line. That's not the same standard that the UN High Commission for Refugees for other conflicts holds. So part of the issue is it's a politicized definition of refugees. Now, I want to just acknowledge that um, there are refugees who are invited to come back and resettled, and that's definitely a fact. Um, but I don't think either side should be held to this idea that um, it's, Israel has a, a right of return and, and that's what we should hold. Because I, I think that's a problematic rule and I don't think it's easy to say what Israel's immigration rules should be. But I, I think those are very different things uh, in understanding this issue. Yeah. Um, okay, and then also I know we have uh, people in the audience who want to ask questions. Uh, uh, do, you, uh, do you guys want to wait for audience questions, or do you have any questions you want to ask the other? Yeah. Do you want a question? Yeah. What? So, so you want a question to ask Danny? Go ahead. Yeah. So, Danny, what, what do you take to be the basis for Israel's right to exist? Well, that's an interesting point, because one could argue that it's a problematic framing for any state to have the right to exist. Uh, I think that the, the historical wrong against the Jewish people, which is unique to a certain degree, especially in the aftermath of the Holocaust, meant that there was um, a global need, an understanding among the states of the post-World War II world that there was a special situation and thus Israel should have a right to a sovereign Jewish state, which is why there was a UN commission, which is why there was a partition, which even though Arabs were still the majority, gave 55% of the land to Israel. Um, this was problematic for a number of reasons since Israelis or Jews only own 7% of the property at that time, but I do think that the special circumstances of the Jewish people made it a global norm, an accepted global norm by most states that later formed the UN to, to have an Israeli state. Now, I will admit that there are intellectual arguments against any state having the right to exist. I choose uh, on my own to accept the Israeli right to exist because of the historic wrongs done to the Jewish people. Oh, um, uh, you have a question to ask, uh, uh, Elan, or do you want to? Sure. Yeah. Uh, the microphone, P microphone, please. So, Ilana, would you please define what you mean by the, quote, defeat of the Palestinian movement? How do you see this proceeding, and, and how long will it take? Sure. So I think it, it's a multi-generation process. It doesn't happen overnight. It requires the kind of shift that happened um, after World War II with um, the... Uh, the Nazi regime in Germany and with Japan. And essentially what it requires, I don't think it requires necessarily a large-scale conflict that's armed and violent, but I think it requires a psychological shift, the abandonment of a goal that is animating the hostilities on one side. And in my analysis, the Palestinian movement is animated by a goal of making the whole of the territory that is now Israel ruled by Palestinians, and that means from the River Jordan to the Mediterranean, that's the phrasing that's commonly used. Um, and I think to, the achievement of that requires sustained pressure and communicating that uh, 
violence is not going to pay, which is the way in which the negotiations, which you, are, you seem to be an advocate for, really uh, encouraged. So the, the, the peace process model was we talked with anybody, we, we, we pretended the Palestinian movement was dealable with and that they were moderating. And we sat down with them numerous times, we meaning the Israelis and then led and sponsored by the US, on the premise that you should speak to anyone. And I, I think that is empirically false. What that led to is they were given the encouragement to think that, wow, we spent decades attacking Israel. We didn't get as far as we wanted, but hey, we just got invited to the di diplomatic negotiations. Look at the, the way in which we've been elevated and given a dignity we've never earned. Arafat was a pioneer of international terrorism and violence. I mean, that, I think, cannot be disputed. And here he was celebrated as somebody who you know, he's given that up. Well, has he? Has he really? So I think that was a, a misconception. And in fact, what those kinds of negotiations led to was, no, is a rewarding of that kind of behavior and a continuation and a funding of it over time. So I think what you want to do is reverse that. So defeat means not rewarding that behavior, but showing that the more you do that kind of thing, the more you attack, the, the less likely you are to ever to reach your goal. And it's, it's a lost goal. Um, so it's a long-term process. It requires shifting the understanding of what's achievable, and that requires significant pressure over time. So, so you, do you believe that they can be militarily defeated, the Palestinian movement? And, and let me just say quickly, because it seems like you're saying Palestinians have to wait more multi-generations. I mean, it's been three or four generations. So now we're saying it's going to be multi-generational to defeat them. So now a Palestinian refugee might have to wait seven or eight generations. But Japan, as you mentioned, got its sovereignty back in 1952, despite attacking Pearl Harbor. And West Germany got its sovereignty back in 1954 and was armed and was given tanks and was put into NATO by 1954. So it only had to go through nine years of occupation prior to regaining its sovereignty. So I, I'm, I'm wondering if, if you really believe that there is a military solution to the Palestinian resistance. I think that can be. I don't think it has to be military, but I think the, the premise of your question is what I think is essential to challenge, and I, I want to raise that, which is you, you seem to be operating on the premise that the Palestinians are entitled to a state, and you're challenging me for saying they don't, and you're, that's part of your argument that I'm being one-sided. Well, let me make it explicit. I don't think the right to self-determination can mean that you are entitled to create your own tyranny and to enslave yourself and the people that you regard as part of your group into slavery or into domination and authoritarianism. There's no such right. And so long as that is what's animating the Palestinian movement, they should not be pursuing, they should not be permitted to pursue a state. Now, if there is a point at which in the future that is no longer the kind of state that they're working to build, then fine, I, I'm all in favor of it. The standard is, you, in order to, to be um, justified in pursuing the, the momentous step of creating a state, which means you have the monopoly on the use of force within a geographical area, that's a momentous step. The only, in my view, the only basis for that is you're actually gonna create a state that protects freedom and, or, or you're leaving a, a situation in which you don't have freedom and you're moving towards a situation with greater freedom, which is my view of sort of the essential premise for Israel's uh, basis. It, it's, a, it's basically free society. If Palestinians really wanted that, and if there was evidence for that, then I would be in favor of it. I would say, yes, go ahead, build yourself a state, create it, support it. I'm not opposed to that. What I'm opposed to, the Palestinians demanding, and the idea that democracy is the all-purpose solvent for making everything good because people, enough people voted for it, which is completely wrong. If that's the principle, then yeah, they should have a state, but that's not the principle. It has to be that you're, the, the only way in which you can make sense of self-determination for a group of people is they're trying to reach freedom, and that's not what the Palestinian movement has been pursuing. Now we can talk about the situation in which they live in today, which is really parlous and, and difficult, but I don't think there's evidence to think there's certainly no evidence that they've given us that what they're trying to do is move towards greater freedom. And that's, what, that's the basis of my objection. And so the issue of how long do they have to wait, they have to wait until they change their mind about what kind of society they want to build. Japan abandoned its goals after World War II with a great deal of pressure, as you know, from, probably from studying this. And Germany was defeated. Both of those were defeated. In the, in, I think those are outstanding examples in history because it was so rapid.
And the fact that the military defeat came first and what happened in Iraq, which I believe you saw firsthand, I don't believe the surge and, and that whole thing of handing out money really is a, a solution. And, and <laughs> yeah, so, so that did not work. And I think we saw that with the rise of ISIS, which was, I think, a fruit of that attempt to solve Iraq by dealing with everybody. So the, the issue is not how long they have to wait. It's what is the goal and what is the standard by which you judge it? Um, no comment. And then, uh, no, 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 no. Well, I do have a comment about that, which, again, it, it, it feels like the Palestinians are being held to a different standard than the Israelis. Um, who is to determine what the people want except for the people themselves through democracy? I agree that democracy is flawed, but as Churchill said, it's uh, the worst solution except for all the others, potentially. Um, in, in your book, sir, you said that you believe that Palestinian grievances, quote, cannot explain, let alone justify the armed struggle uh, of the Palestinians. But Article 51 of the UN Charter recognizes, quote, the inherent right of individual or collective self-defense, and the Protocol 1 addition to the Geneva Conventions explicitly recognizes armed conflicts in which people are fighting against alien occupation. So, I mean, one could argue that because the Palestinians are still in a state of resistance, still in a state of insurgency, that, you know, we've never really seen what a Palestinian state would look like. We've only seen the state lit of a collaborationist regime that really looks like Swiss cheese because though the Israelis have pulled settlements out of Gaza, which were minimal to begin with, and pulled the furthest outposts out of the West Bank, nothing has been done about the 500,000 Jewish Israeli settlers in the West Bank, which have turned, if you've seen a map of the West Bank, it looks like a piece of Swiss cheese, rather delicious, quite frankly. I mean, it's a problem. Um, you want to make a comment to, to, to questions? Sure. I'll make okay. a, a okay. brief comment. Okay. Um, so I, 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 have, uh, I have a real objection to the idea that there's a two different standards here. I think there is one standard, and that is, are you living up to, are you trying to achieve a free society? And I think democracy is not the standard. Democracy is a tool, is a, is a subordinate part of what makes a society free. It's an, it's an essential part of it. But it is not what makes something good or right, just because people vote for it. Now, the issue is um, the, the issue that uh, you're raising here, which is you're invoking international treaties and laws and this whole regime um, of armed resistance and so forth. Um, I question that. I'm not entirely convinced that that is. So can 180 countries be wrong? Yeah, they can be wrong. The question is, is this a moral principle? And. I, I would go further than that because I'm, I should make my, put a cards on the table. I am not a fan of the UN. I, am, I think there are serious problems with the con customary so-called laws of war, and including the moral premises that govern um, the conduct of war. I think morality is essential in conduct of war and having standards for what you do in the battlefield. But I think there are real problems with the, the standards that are imposed because they disadvantage those who obey them, and they empower those who disobey them. So there's a clear problem with that. Uh, and the, the idea that we treat UN uh, bodies or, or international law as essentially like a papal uh, pronouncement that it's unquestionable, I, I think that's a mistake. You have to really think about, is this right or not? And you, you can make an argument that the Palestinians are trying to resist occupation. And I'm sure they hate being under, under occupation. A lot of them being told that this is all Israel's fault. The question, however, is what has their life been like during occupation? I, I'm sure none, nobody in this room would choose to live under occupation. But did you know, and this is relevant, and I'm sure uh, this has come up in, in your reading of this, is that however bad you might think or it, the occupation actually has been, the material measurements of life for Palestinians are better 20 years into the occupation than they were before in terms of life expectancy, infant mortality. The hookups to electricity were like at 8%. They were at 90% within 15 years. Now, you might say, yeah, screw it. I still hate the Israelis. That's fine. But you, if you're talking about individual human beings and the, the welfare that they need to live, then you can't argue that the, the, they're not materially better off under occupation, even if they still dream of, of a Palestinian state. So the question is, are they seeking freedom and a better life? And that, to me, is the standard by which we have to evaluate these things. Um, You'll you get, you get a chance to respond, but we should, you might want to fit in your remarks to, to the question. Uh, the first questioner, please uh, phrase your question as a question, uh, if you could. Please. Well, I'd like to 
thank the Major Danny for his service, and uh, hopefully Elon has a, or, the dual citizenship has worked well for you. Uh, it's hard to believe I'm old enough to be both of your grandfathers. Do you have a... But I, I, ha I, I... Do you have I, a question, I, Grandpa? Yeah, I... I <laughs> I was brought up uh, oh. uh, with, uh, with uh, the fact uh, uh, that wars, all wars, are bankers' wars. Bankers' wars. And, and at the same time, uh, I was always taught to follow the money. Uh, and so it's not a mistake that uh, Arafat, Yasser Arafat, uh, he, he left how many years? Over, over 10 years ago, uh, with, with, uh, even though he was killed under uh, inauspicious circumstances, but his family has billions. And, uh, and I don't know your, how, what's, what's how... Your, what's your question? My your question is, how do you expect to end a, a conflagration that exists right now, especially when the, uh, the Arabs, who are really the Palestinians, I don't know where Palestine came from. It's not mentioned anywhere. What is your question? My question is, how, how are you going to end a conflict that exists right now if, if what's behind the, behind the conflict uh, is something that really is not what we could, what we could put our fingers on. Uh, I, one thing that's relevant is if the question is about the economic conditions that the Palestinian leadership have enjoyed, there is a difference which is worth noting that the, the PLO of which Arafat was the leader and then uh, Mahmoud Abbas, they're much more in the model of the kind of secular Arab dictator who not only dominates his people, but also exploits them economically. So there's definitely a, a, a great deal of documented graft and racketeering under the Palestinian Authority. What the difference is, though, that the Hamas, and this, is, this speaks to its ideological character, uh, one of the ways in which it's gained support and credibility is that it's seen as uncorruptible precisely because it's religious. I mean, it, the way it gets funding is not from outside regimes, according to its propaganda. It gets its money from uh, zakat, which is a, a kind of tithe, a religious tithe. Now, the reality is Hamas does get outside funding, but the, the essential issue is that the PLO is much more in the model of exploiting its people economically as well, and the Hamas is definitely, it makes a point of not doing that explicitly because that's part of its uh, prestige. Uh, do you want to make a comment, Ben? Absolutely. I, I don't think that the conflict will end um, anytime soon. I don't think there will be a military defeat. Um, my opponent keeps talking about how the only time you have a right to a state is if it's in favor of freedom, and the word freedom and freedom, and I, and I think it's an excellent word, but what we don't have for the Palestinians is any freedom to form its own sovereign state. They've never had that at any point. No, 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 excuse me. Jo Jordan is uh, not the same as Palestinians. Uh, as oh, excuse me. You, if you want to ask a question, is please ask a question in a civil fashion. Rude and, uh, you know, yeah. anti-intellectual. Uh, as for the economy, it is true that the economy of the occupied territories grew very rapidly, specific in the 1970s, but this was only tying the Palestinian economy to Israel's whims, and it was never accompanied by you know, any major in internal development as its own society. So uh, one major economic report noted, quote, the growth witnessed in the territories is fundamentally not, dis not sustainable, and ending the occupation is the prerequisite for transforming the territory's economic potential into reality. Um, you want to make another comment? Just two brief comments. So, you know, in my book, what I argue is that the Palestinians have not had the full expression of a state with full sovereignty. That's certainly true. I agree with that. But what you can measure is to the extent that they've achieved some measure of self-rule, some self degree of governance, self-governance, you can see that uh, in several places. The Palestinian Authority is the most recent, 1994 to the present, the Gaza Strip from which Israel withdrew every last person um, and, and left it to the Palestinians, so there's no occupation left there. Uh, and you can see it as well in when the PLO set up bases on the border with Jordan and when it later set up bases under uh, the, within the Palestinian refugee camps in Lebanon. And in all those cases, there's commonalities in terms of the way they governed, which was authoritarian, and in, it was the, they had the practice of, of thought control and arbitrary courts and, and just the kind of things that you don't want to see. And then this get, got full expression under the or fuller expression under the Palestinian Authority, which is a step towards a full state. So look, if I, I get what you're saying, Danny, that you want the Palestinians to have the room to create the kind of state that you think they should have. But I'd love to know what is the evidence for thinking that it would be anything better than and in fact not worse than what we see in the Palestinian Authority today and, and in Gaza because 
where, where do you see the evidence for that? Do you want to mention, uh, answer that? Of course. Um, you know what's really important is we don't have the evidence for that because there has been no sovereignty for the Palestinians in anything except a statelet that looks like Swiss cheese that is essentially a collaborationist regime with the Israeli authorities. Palestinians have as much sovereignty as their masters give them. And their masters are the ones with the American weapons and with the American money. The reality is they cannot militarily defeat Israel, but Israel cannot militarily defeat them. We don't know what real Palestinian sovereignty would look like because it has not existed since 1948. <laughs> Okay. Okay. But please, please, please. One thing about please, that. Please, please, please fit this in a little bit later. Uh, we we have questions. Uh, questions from the audience. Go ahead. Please ask a question. Hello, my question is to Elon. Uh, you base a lot of your argument about defeating the movement in the fact that Hamas wants to eliminate is Israel. Uh, that's what you said. But in American law, if someone wants to kill me, it doesn't give me the right to kill the person. So why do you think Americans should support that defeat? Um, you get the question? Yeah. I, I think I get it. But the, what we're dealing with is a situation that's not governed by American law. And the, the principle is not uh, you have a right to kill the person attacking you. You have a right to defend yourself. That's the principle. Now, what I'm arguing for, and I argue for it in more detail in the book than I do here, is that to understand what Hamas is about and what the Palestinian movement has been doing since it came to the fore, is it's a sustained campaign over time with that animating goal. Now, are they militarily in a position to destroy Israel? I don't think they are, but they would like to be. And they've, uh, they've shown with their numerous attacks that that's what they're after, and to, to essentially psychologically destroy Israel by terrorizing it, and that's the goal. Um, my argument is Israel has a right to self-defense. Now, because this is a long-standing war, I think the way out of this conflict, and I think it is solvable, is if you give them to believe through action that their goal is unachievable. And you can do that. Wars have ended because one side has given up its goal and has been led to believe that this is hopeless. And I think the, the idea that that's um, a fantasy is ignoring the fact that we've seen this in other contexts. I mean, World War II ended not because we, we negotiated with the Nazis, we could defeated them. World War, and we defeated the, the Japanese. Now, there's certainly uh, uh, a great deal of reluctance to fight and defeat people. I mean, Obama said he doesn't like to use the word victory, and Danny certainly doesn't think that's achievable. And I agree, Iraq was a no-win war, but it is not because we fought to win, it's because we didn't fight to win. And I think there's many things to say about that. Um, and, and I'm sorry that you had to suffer some of the, the, the consequences of that. Now, that's what I said. I mean, I've been arguing about the failure of American foreign policy in the Middle East for a long time. And, and I think it's a misconception to think you can't end wars through defeat. I can assure you that I fought to win. Um, the, reality, the reality is there was no victory over the Iraqi people so long as we tried to create a country in our own image. The reality was we violated Iraqi sovereignty, and so long as we did so, there would be a forever insurgency. Correct, World War II ended, but it was a conventional war declared between powers. But every one of those countries involved in World War II that held colonies, every one of them lost those colonies to much less technologically advanced militaries because national movements do not easily die. Uh, question, next question. Yeah. I. I don't have time to, um, um, I challenge your, uh, your understanding. Who's, who's you? Who's you? Who, who's the question? Oh, to, to Elon. To Elon, I yeah. challenge your um, understanding of the uh, Palestinian Authority. I've been there a lot, and I've studied a lot, and it's not like the Nazis, and it's not like the Japanese, and, and it doesn't have to be defeated in the same way. But the, my bigger question is about the two-state solution. Beyond... Without a two-state solution, you have two choices. You either have a, basically what's close to apartheid, a stateless people, or you have a single entity, which would mean there would be no Jewish state. And, and um, so there's really no other solution that is at all satisfactory to people who either believe in an idea of a Jewish state and want one, or who believe in democracy and do not want a revival of of the evils that we have already seen with, uh, in South Africa and other places. Uh, okay, you get your question? That's a question addressed to you, Elon, I guess. Uh, challenges you, yeah. Um, you, you, 
the, I think it's relevant to think about what it means for there to be an end to this conflict. And I don't think it's you start with, well, what does the configuration of the society look like? I think you have to start with what is, the, what is driving the conflict and how do you end it? And then there are going to be questions about, well, what happens then? What kind of society should there be once the Palestinian movement is no longer seeking to liquidate uh, its opponent, Israel? And I think they're, they're real hard questions, and I, I, I agree. We certainly don't want a whole population that is denied citizenship. And I think you, the Israelis certainly won't accept being a minority. I think they're, they're fearful of that, and I think for a number of good historical reasons, they're fearful of being a minority in their own country. I don't think that's an easy problem to solve. I, I mean, it, but I think what you what I think it's a mistake to turn that around and say, well, the obvious solution is they got to have to be two states. I don't think that's obvious, and I don't think it's um, the way to begin. I think the way to begin is to say, why has this been going on for so long, and why, what's driving it, and what, what are the ideas going on here, um, and then what is the principle that should govern it? Can we, cons I mean, I want to say something about can, what can we expect from a Palestinian state, and it's, I don't think it's true that we don't know. I think we have a lot of empirical evidence of what the ideas of the Palestinian movement mean in practice, and I think it's also telling. If you look at the, the scholarship of uh, Rashid Khalidi, who is a Palestinian scholar, he is a Columbia, he wrote a book about the, why the Palestinian movement has failed in its attempt to state building. And one of the things that struck me in reading this is that he says, sort of, he doesn't take it as seriously as I do, but he says in passing, look, they, they have given so little thought to what it would look like to achieve a state that it is alarming. And to me, that is, well, it's not only alarming, it's suspicious. Because if you spent decades yearning for sovereignty, wouldn't you give it a lot more thought about what it would actually look like? Wouldn't you promulgate what that actually looks like? And I think the, the absence of doing that speaks to, this is not a sincere effort at righting wrongs or serving a Palestinian people, who some of whom have suffered severely. So I think there's a lot of things to solve once you get past moving the obstacles in the road. And some of those are really hard things to solve, and I, I, I think you've hit on one of those. Uh, you want to comment, uh, Danny? Okay, all right. Uh, we have, unfortunately, we have time for only one final question before we go to the summations. So please ask a question. Yeah. Uh, I guess this is a f uh, more philosophical question to both uh, uh, to both uh, groups here. Um, I'm unclear whether the arguments are deontological or consequentialist. So as far as Elon is concerned. Um, you've, you made a moral presumption, and maybe I'm asking this as being a different kind of libertarian, that um, freedom is somehow tied to democracy, individuality, and secularism, and therefore have rigged the debate uh, for the side of Israel. And on the side of uh, Danny, um, it's unclear to me whether you're arguing for the feasibility or the desirability, because your arguments have been for the desirability of, of uh, collaborating with the, with the um, movement, the Palestinian movement, but you haven't really demonstrated the feasibility because the question is, what if it is impossible to both have a Jewish state and to collaborate with them? Would you then take a deontological position and say, no, we still have to collaborate, or a consequentialist one and say, well, maybe we have to do something else, and if so, what would it be? Um, why don't you go first, Danny, on this one. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that a Palestinian state um, is desirable. It is not currently feasible so long as there are Jewish-only roads, Jewish-only settlements, 500,000 Israelis in the West Bank. Gaza shut off from both the sea and the land. It's the most heavily, densely populated place on the earth. Half the people get their goods from United Nations organizations. So I, I think, yes, it is as it stands relatively infeasible for there to be a Palestinian state. But largely, I would argue, that is due to the intransigence of Israeli policy and self-defeating violence on the behalf of terrorist elements within the Palestinians. And I agree with Rashid Khalidi, and it's interesting you brought him up, because he does critique rightfully aspects of the PLO, aspects of the Palestinian Authority. But what must be remembered is he is one of the preeminent historians in favor of Palestinian nationalism, in favor of a Palestinian sovereign entity. So uh, I think that in its current state, it's not feasible, but through honest negotiations, a removal of the military occupation, and a removal of the settlements, it is possible. You want to take an extra minute on your summation, and, and uh, to, so we go to, want to go to the summations, and you can answer that question and take the podium. Okay, thanks. <laughs>
So I'll try to summation, uh, give you my summation, and I'll try to address that question that you raised last. Um, I'm an atheist, and I'm an individualist, I'm an advocate of liberty, and I believe that liberty or the principle of freedom has to be the framework by which to understand the claims in this conflict and the character of the adversaries. I don't accept that we have no basis for thinking that a what a Palestinian state would look like. I think we have a great deal of evidence to know what to expect. And I think it's the responsibility of anyone who's advocating for that as an outcome, anyone who's in favor of a Palestinian state in the present, to make the case that it would be a moral state, meaning it would be, it would protect the lives and freedom of Palestinians and do so more so than ever in the past and that it's meeting that standard. I don't think anyone has put forward that basis, that evidence, and I think it's, it's a dodge. And, and unfortunately, I, I, I think there's a great deal of evidence that that's dodging to say we don't know what it would look like. It's a problem that we don't know what it would look like. And it, there's been enough development in political thought over the last 200 years for people to pick up, say, the Federalist Papers, to pick up the US Constitution, and learn something from it and say, look, this is the sort of thing we're thinking of doing. What do you think of that? Is, does that make sense to you? We can make a case that this is what we're doing. But just to say, we're a group, we deserve a state, and you're, a, you're not letting us have it, and we're going to rage against that, that is not an argument that deserves credibility. And let me add that um, there are many more historical issues that have been raised that we didn't get a chance to answer and, and claims that uh, my opponent has raised that I haven't had a chance to answer. Some of them are addressed in the book, and I encourage you to look at that. Um, the issue that I, I want to stress is that um, the Palestinian movement does exist. It's a real thing. They think of themselves as a movement, even if uh, the opponent tonight says that I'm, I'm simplifying it. The, there is a progression that you can track over time. And what may, maybe it's difficult to conceptualize, but what, what brings it together, what coheres uh, in this movement, it's the goal of a state in place of Israel. And that state is, a, it, it, what defines that state is some sort of authoritarian or, or theocratic type model of the, we see plenty of in the Middle East. Um, and that's the unity of this movement, even if the, the justifications for it over time went from Arab nationalism, Palestinian nationalism, and now it's more framed in Islamist terms. Uh, but that's the unifying uh, thread through, the t through time. I haven't made the case, and I, I'm sorry if you've been led to believe this, I haven't made the case that Israel is blameless or that it is, uh, is somehow a, a saint. That is certainly not the view I opened with, and it's certainly not my view, and it's certainly not the view you'll find in my book. I castigate Israel for many of its flaws, and there are more that we can talk about. Um, I think it's a mistake to present the, the major obstacle being Israel, even if it's, made, uh, even if it's not being entirely uh, uh, fair here uh, and, and has committed wrongs. The, over time, the pattern is that uh, Israel is responding to aggression that is, um, there's significant reason to believe is um, seeking to do significant damage to life and property. And in response to that, I think it's being justified in retaliating against them. If it's going beyond that, then it's wrong. And that's the standard that I apply here. And I think what's missing is, um, I. I think what the, the silence that I, I, I'm glad was partially broken tonight, but not completely, is you have to judge a movement not only by its ideas and its charter and its, its founding documents, but also by its actions, and I agree with that. And I think that um, the, the issue here tonight is the Palestinian movement has been true to its ideas, and we have to take seriously what those ideas are. Uh, and, and pretending that they're not there or, or trying to uh, whitewash them or say, well, let's just bite our tongue and we have to talk to anybody, I think that misses the point. And uh, it is uh, significant that the Palestinian issue has become not only Islamicized in the sense that the leading faction, Hamas, is it's acting on the idea of, ideas of an Islamic society. That's what it seeks to do but that it is aligned with other forces in the region, principally Iran and Qatar, that are supporting this idea. 
Uh, and I suggest that, in this sense, the conflict is now really, it's stark. It's in terms of the ideas. Do you believe that it's better to have a free society, or do you believe in tyranny, whether it's nationalist or theocratic? And that, to me, is the question. Thank you. Why am I here tonight taking the position in favor of a Palestinian state? By any logical measure, with Islamist organizations in both Iraq and Afghanistan taking the lives of so many of those who I had loved, one would think that I would take the position of many of my less educated soldiers, which was to hate Islam, okay? To hate Arabs in the case of Iraq. But I came to a place of respect for the vast majority of the people in the Middle East and I realized that there were both strategic and ethical reasons to care for both sides in this conflict, and thus I applied it to the Israel-Palestine conflict. I've hoped to illustrate not a pro-Palestinian position tonight, but a middle road, one that recognizes the strengths of Israeli democracy at times, and also recognizes the plight of the Palestinians. I do think you've heard another approach that's rather biased that lambasts the very notion that Palestinians as a movement have any meaningful grievances or right to self-defense. There's something else, and it's a rather personal matter, but it's an essential one nonetheless. It applies to my third assertion, that Israeli policy must carry some blame for the intractability of the conflict. Israel is not alone in carrying some of that blame. Additionally, the United States must recognize its own complicity in hindering peace. Virulent hatred for the U.S., for, is, for Israel, and Islamist terror plots in the West will not meaningfully decrease until Washington at least begins to address the roots of the problem and rebalance its one-sided relationship with Israel. First off, it's the right thing to do. Second, it's a pivot away from these more unhinged policies will actually make American soldiers, Israeli soldiers, and civilians in both societies, Israel and the United States, ultimately safer. To wit, this army officer, whose interpreter from Iraq, Akil from Sadr City, is here tonight. We heard earfuls about Israel policy, about America's support for Israel, from angry moderates, moderates, mind you, around the middle of the road in Iraqi society, in both Iraq and Afghanistan, decorating dingy Baghdad apartments and Kandahar hovels with pictures of the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem was quite common. These people cared about average Palestinians. Even former CIA director and General Petraeus, not exactly a liberal snowflake, recognized this way back in 2010 when he said that U.S. favoritism towards Israel endangers his troops. He was predictably lambasted by certain lobbying groups, but that didn't make him wrong. If you want to genuinely protect the homeland and the troops and the Israeli troops from Islamist-inspired violence, then insist that both Washington and Israel demonstrate some sense of equity and justice in Israel-Palestine. That's what's missing from the other argument tonight. Compromise is the only way to peace. It was the case in Northern Ireland. It was the case in almost every anti-colonial movement. Framing one side, Israel in this case, as the protagonist, will gain us nothing besides the further alienization and radicalization of a new generation of aggrieved Palestinians. For compromise requires personal humility and self-awareness from both sides. The Palestinian movement must swear off counterproductive and despicable terror attacks on civilians, and Israel must measure its own violent attacks with a de required degree of proportionality and care for its usual victims, which are not Israeli civilians, but Palestinian noncombatants, statistically. All serious Arab groups, Hamas included, must accept the existence of Israel and a two-state solution. This may sound like a tall order, but notice how, unlike my opponent's affirmation of the resolution, it recognizes the guilt and responsibilities of both sides. It recognizes the notion of sovereignty for both sides. My opponent loves the state of Israel. It, 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 it honestly bleeds through as an admirable quality in his every word, but he's missing the fact that just liking Israel's democracy more than the secular Arab regimes or the Islamist Arab regimes does not make it any more likely that there'll be a, mili a military or political victory coming in the occupied territories. Me, I'm through with such fanciful make-believe. It died with eight of my own soldiers in Baghdad and Kandahar. Israel can no more defeat the narrowly defined Palestinian movement than the mass of American military machine could win any sort of military victory in Iraq or Afghanistan. Now is the time for realism, not fantasy. 
Israel must engage Palestinian groups and negotiate. Whatever your personal beliefs, loyalties, or inclinations, I ask that you show the rationality and intellectual honesty to vote in the negative and reject this resolution. To do so does not reject Israel, its people, its existence, or its right to security. It merely recognizes there are two sides in this tale of woe, that there may, just may be, still a middle path to, to peace that involves a two-state solution. Reject this resolution because you have heads and hearts, and you know there's no other rational way. Thank you. Um, uh, thank, thank you to, uh, to you both. And uh, we are uh, now going to do uh, the final voting. Uh, Elon uh, is going to be signing books. Uh, afterwards, he'll be at that table, and he can chat with you. And uh, uh, Danny, you please stick around as well, because a lot of people uh, will uh, want to chat. Uh, next uh, n uh, next uh, month, uh, we're going to be debating uh, the issue of climate change. Uh, hope you can make it. In, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in August, we're going to be debating uh, Bitcoin once again. Uh, that uh, event uh, has had, uh, the, the, our previous debate on Bitcoin had 450,000 views on YouTube and was sold out weeks in advance. You may want to buy, buy tickets to that event in August. Uh, I'm going to be once again debating socialism in November uh, against a, uh, this time, somebody who is sort of my own size, a, a, an emeritus professor named Richard Wolf from University of Massachusetts uh, debating the broad issue of socialism that will probably not be at this hall because we usually get, hopefully, a lot of socialists to show up. And uh, we had, uh, we sold nearly 500 tickets to the last socialist debate I, I held with Basco Sankara, who I gather is gracing the pages of, of New York Magazine, did not listen to me when I told him you could start the socialist re revolution right now, just put some of the money together, it could happen. Uh, he's preferred to go the intellectual route, and uh, I'm not surprised that he did that. Um, uh, uh, Jane, where do we stand on the voting? Uh, do we, uh, one more minute uh, on, uh, on, on the voting. Uh, again, I want to thank my wife, who's catered this affair, and thank C-SPAN. C-SPAN has filmed this. And uh, so uh, you will be on C-SPAN. Um, and uh, it will also be uh, 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 shown on video by Reason, and will be available on, on our website. Uh, in, uh, in May, we're going to be debating uh, 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 vegetarianism. Uh, the, uh, and uh, so a real food fight uh, in May um, versus the rather tame debate we had this evening. Um, and. Um, uh, and uh, again, I, I, I do want to, we were a little bit nervous about the, uh, the, the import of this debate, and uh, I want to commend you all and commend our, our speakers, our debaters, especially on the civility that they felt toward each other. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and, um, Can you guys shake hands? Yeah, well, they will, they will. In, in fact, usually, usually there's hugging. But if you guys want, just want to shake hands, we have a no hugging. Okay, 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 okay. Um, the okay, the the, uh, the voting went this way. Uh, the the yes vote uh, for the resolution was 27.2 percent, uh, and uh, the yes vote picked up nine points, uh, went to 36 percent. So that nine points was the figure to beat. The no vote went from 33% to 15, 50%, picked up 14 points. So the no vote wins the Tootsie Roll. A congratulations to you both. Yeah.